Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Are you all able to see my screen right now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank you all for being here. As those of you who got here right away uh, heard me say, I'm so grateful for you taking time out of this uh, maniacal year to talk a little bit about accessibility and some of the things that we can do for our students. Um, I'm really here to facilitate. Um, I am not an Uber expert. And so there may be things that you know that I don't know um, and things that we can share and learn from each other. Um, but my name is Dr. Karen Crozer. So I am currently a distance education specialist at Mission College and I also teach English. And my inspiration when it comes to accessibility issues is my mom. She passed in 2010, but before her passing, she was very passionate about helping students with disabilities. And that always really pushed me forward because I saw her fighting for students who were at the margins, and I really wanted to do that too. So um, that's really my inspiration. Um, I also wanted to let you know that even though I'm at Mission College, if there is ever something I can help you with, and you're not at Mission, because I saw there's quite a few of you who registered who are from the other colleges, please feel free to reach out to me. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to ask someone who might have the answer and get an answer for you one way or the other. So I'm going to display my email at the end of this. So feel free to reach out. And also just during the discussion, if you have questions, feel free to you know say something, uh, to write something in the chat. If you don't have a microphone, um, whatever's easiest. Um, I would like to dedicate this training to a friend of mine who just recently passed. His name is Joel Harris. And he was a veteran who fought in Afghanistan. He had just finished his law degree at Pepperdine and he was really passionate about helping disabled veterans. And he's gonna kind of tie into someone that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, and also just if I seem a little, um, I definitely don't necessarily seem my, feel my best right now because of this loss and I'm really missing this uh, family friend. But bear with me if I am a little more garbledy gook in my talk than I normally am. So I'm kind of dealing with that right now. Okay, so I want to give credit that a lot of this training's language is from an at one course called Creating Accessible Course Content and it's shared through a Creative Commons license. Um, I would definitely recommend that you take the course if this is something you'd like to learn more about. It's much more in depth than what I can possibly cover in an hour and a half, and it's very helpful. Um, I think right now that they are running $85 and you can usually get half reimbursed, check with your campus, but it's a great class and you can also find it in Commons if you don't wanna take the facilitated version. So I have a couple of goals for all of us on this brief training, um, and I hope we'll be able to hit some of them. Um, the first is I want us to briefly, because we don't have a lot of time, discuss federal and state regulations that are important to accessibility in online education, which is the world we obviously are all living right now with COVID. Secondly, I want to explain barriers to access and assistive technologies designed to overcome these barriers. Third, I want you to know how to create an initial accessibility plan and make a basic inventory of course materials and resources. And finally, I want you to be able to identify campus resources that support building and delivery of accessible courses. So those are my goals and it's not a lot of time, but hopefully we will get through them. So the title of this training and really sort of the place that I think we need to start is what does accessibility mean? It's a word we use a lot in education. It's definitely a buzzword, um, but we don't always um, use it exactly um, the way that it actually means. So I put up this definition that accessibility refers to the ability for everyone regardless of disability or special needs to access, use, and benefit 
from everything within their environment. So in other words, accessibility means access. And this was a statistic that um, you may have not heard before. It was definitely um, interesting to me as I was researching this presentation that one in four Americans has some kind of disability. So if you're looking at a class of say 40 students, statistically speaking, 10 of them could have some kind of disability, whether or not you get an accommodation letter for them, they may be dealing with a disability. And not all of them, as you know, are going to be visible. Something like, um, you know, a depression or something else is going to be invisible. So one of the, I think, most important stories to start with when it comes to accessibility has to do with a small-ish town in my home state. I'm from Michigan and in the town of Kalamazoo in 1945, so around the time of the end of World War II, there was an injured veteran who was also an attorney named Jack Fisher, um, which is why I wanted to dedicate this to my friend Joel, who was also a veteran who was hoping to be an attorney for disabled veterans. So basically in 1945, Jack Fisher realized that there were all these curbs in Kalamazoo and that all of the injured veterans were having trouble getting from the curb to the road. This made it hard for them to find work, made them hard, hard to do daily tasks like go to the grocery store because it was just difficult to, to jump this curb. And so what Fisher did is he petitioned the city of Kalamazoo to design and install curb cuts, ramps, and safety rails. And of course now they're pretty ubiquitous. I'm sure you've seen many in your lifetime, but basically there'll be a little cut in the pavement where someone can roll down. Now these changes cost Kalamazoo at the time less than a thousand dollars. And it significantly improved the life of disabled veterans um, by making that very, very simple change. And What's at the heart of that story is a really simple principle. And the principle is that poor design limits use while smart design broadens use. We wanna be smart designers. We don't wanna think for a few people. We wanna think for everyone. And what was really interesting about curb cuts was they were designed to help veterans initially, but they helped many more people than veterans. They allowed better access for people on bikes. It was easier for mothers and fathers pushing strollers. It was easier for travelers going to and from the train station with their luggage. I mean, we could continue probably to make lists, street vendors who have carts with wheels. All kinds of people benefited from this very simple design change. And as we sort of get into this idea of, sex, of accessibility, one, this is really one of the things that's very cool is that when we start by thinking about how we can reach students with disabilities, we start to reach people we never even intended because we're thinking about smart design that can reach everybody. Um, so one definition that I got from North Carolina State University um, describes universal design as a design concept that recognizes, respects, values, and attempts to accommodate the broadest possible spectrum of human ability in the designs of all products, environments, and information systems. So that's the goal. We might not arrive there right away. We might not hit the mark every time, but that's a goal that we can have in our lives for our classes. And this is very common now in design of cities and design of buildings because you want the buildings that you make to be accessible to everybody. So a couple components of universal design, and you will hear people talk about it if you are interested in architecture or design, but you want your design to be equitable. So equally useful to people with diverse abilities. You want it to be flexible, supporting differing abilities, simple, you know, the design should be intuitive and not confusing. Perceptible, if somebody can't see it or understand it, then it's not working. So the design offers material in multiple modalities. Tolerance for error, 
humans make a lot of mistakes. When you design something, you can't expect that people will use it perfectly every time. So remember that error is part of the, the process when you make something for human beings. Um, effortless, so it minimizes repetition and repetitive actions. And finally, spacious, the design includes appropriate room for users. So as we sort of start to think about universal design in our classes, um, something that's very common for faculty to feel, and not all of you will feel this necessarily, but if you do, it is a normal feeling that faculty sometimes do fear making their courses accessible. And I think there's usually two main reasons. Um, the first one is the one that I can really relate to a lot, and it's a lot of technical de details so it can be very overwhelming um, for people. And so they can feel like this is an insurmountable mountain, why even try? And then the other one is that sometimes faculty think, well, what are the chances that I'm gonna have a vision or hearing impaired student in my course? So why should I go through all this trouble just in case somebody joins at some point in the future? But what I would say to that is, kind of what we were just talking about. When you start considering reaching students with disabilities, you will find that it improves your design for all kinds of students that you didn't even initially have in mind. And just like anything else, you start by taking one step. It's one step after the other. You practice, you learn a little bit, you fail a little bit, and you learn a little bit more. And little by little, you start to feel more confident. And of course, at the end of the day, we, we need to build this competence because we need to comply with state and federal law. So um, it's worth taking the time to master these things. Oh, I just saw in the chat that someone taught in Kalamazoo for two years. That's very cool. I love Kalamazoo. Okay. So two major pieces of legislation that provide the foundation for our approach to accessibility is the Americans with Disability Act. You've probably heard the acronym ADA and then Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And these two pieces of legislation really provide the underlying mandate for designing courses that are accessible to students. Um, another sort of foundational piece when it comes to online education um, is in 2011, the California Community College's Distance Education Task Force compiled a distance education accessibility guidelines. Of course, technology evolves very quickly. And some of the things that they wrote about have you know, changed or evolved or the situation has advanced, but those initial principles are still considered very foundational to what we do today. <laughs> Okay, um, so the first one that I just want to briefly touch on is ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. This became law in 1990, and it's a civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life. And the goal is really to make sure that people with disabilities have the exact same rights as everybody else, same opportunity. There's also section 508, and that has to do with, that was amended, so Congress amended, sorry, whoop, uh, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 um, in 1998 to require federal agencies to make their electronic and information technology accessible to people with disabilities. And then the one other sort of acronym that I think is useful that you may see, like me, I'm, I was just learning this acronym this semester, is the WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And these come from California's AB 434, and it required departments to post on their website a certificate of their state mm -hmm. entity's accessibility for their website. So in other words, we're state employees, right, working for the California Community College District. So our, the things that we have on our website need to be completely accessible um, and would need to follow these guidelines. 
So I'm not going to go a lot into the technical details because we just don't have time. Um, and there are people with more expertise than me. But that's just sort of a basic overview of some of the things that inform um, the decisions that we need to make as teachers now. And um, this was something, sorry, that came up in the accessibility training when I took it. And I thought this was a really good point, which is that I know it's hard to change things. I know in education, we're asked to change things all the time. There's all kinds of trends and fads and some of them come and some of them go. And it, yes, it can be a, a pain to adapt. You know, just when you got everything the way you wanted, all your PDFs, all your files, suddenly you realize they're not accessible and you have to do all this work again. It can be frustrating, um, but remember teaching is an evolving field. It always has been. Um, so this is a quote from the class that I liked. If the practice of teaching did not change over time, we'd all be standing on the steps of a public building in the civic square lecturing to the city's elite. Well, at least the men would be. But it does change, and one of the agents driving this change is the desire to teach more effectively to a broader range of students. So yeah, it is frustrating sometimes to have put in a lot of work and have to put in more and have to change the way we do things. But this is our field, this is our profession. And if we wanna reach students broadly, we have to also adapt. So universal design is often used in architecture, like we were just talking about. So city planners, architects will use it for developing public buildings and urban centers. Um, what we are beginning to use as teachers is something called UDL, which is universal design for learning. So we're kind of modifying the process for what it is that we do, which is teaching. And so I'm gonna give you a brief overview and a little bit later in breakout rooms, I'm gonna give you um, a moment to kind of dive a little deeper into what some of these things might mean. But here's sort of three main categories to think about how we can apply this universal design to learning. So the first one, if you look at the, the brain with the green marks has to do with multiple means of engagement. So how are you engaging your students? Are you doing it the same way every time? Are they just going into your shell and listening to an hour and a half lecture and that's it? Or are there lots of different ways that they're learning and being engaged? Because remember, people learn in a lot of different ways. I know you know this uh, as teachers, that some people are visual learners, some people are auditory, some people are kinesthetic. So we have to, people are as diverse as the number of snowflakes in the sky. So we have to create multiple ways of engaging them and not just expect students to adapt to our preferred way of being engaged. Because we all have our own personal preferences and sometimes we tend to think that everyone learns like we do, but that's just not true. And so we need to give lots of ways to engage our students. Um, the second one has to do with multiple means of representation. Um, and building resourceful, knowledgeable learners. So, you know, you don't always just want to give PowerPoints. You want to sometimes do videos, sometimes do audio. Lots of different representations of materials so that students have many different opportunities to learn it. And then finally, multiple means of action and expression. So we want our learners to reach certain goals. So for instance, I'm an English teacher and the main goal usually in an English class in terms of SLOs has to do with writing a six to eight page paper. For instance, in English 101 admission, our sort of capstone is a six to eight page academic paper. Now an academic paper is great preparation for a four year school. It's, it's challenging. It's a great means of action and expression, but it is only one means of action and expression. So if I only give my students the opportunity to write academic papers over and over again through the class, I'm missing all these different ways that they could practice the skills I'm teaching them about language, about argumentation. Whereas I would be much more effective if I gave them more than one way. Of course, yes, I still have to keep that academic papers in there and that needs to be a big part of what I do. But I also build in low stakes writing opportunities like discussions and pre-writing activities 
and um, sometimes they design worksheets that explain difficult argumentation topics. Um, the sky's kind of the limit here, but it's thinking about what are different ways that they can express and act on the information that you've given them. Um, I have a little video for you, but before I start, I just want to stop and ask, are there any questions so far? Okay. How do you apply OER? Okay, we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, you could probably do a whole deep dive on OER, um, but I will definitely go over the basics and I'll, I can talk you through it a little bit. Okay, so this is gonna be a short video on universal design for learning. And I think I set it up so you should be able to hear my computer, but if you can't, um, somebody just say something once it starts. Imagine you went into a big clothes store and all that was in sale was one type of outfit, in one size, with no talk given to different individual body shapes or personalities. That would be crazy, right? Expecting everyone to be able to fit into the same size and express themselves in the same colour and style? Yet in many cases, that's exactly what is happening in our education system. When it comes to learning, variability is the rule, not the exception, and our college campuses are now grappling with the demands of an increasingly diverse cohort of learners with increasing numbers of international students, students from different cultural and socioeconomic backgrounds, mature students, and students with disabilities. Despite this, curriculums are still designed for the mythical average learner, and all are expected to engage and learn on the same terms. Not enough flexibility is built in at the design stage to give all students equal opportunities to learn in ways that play to their own strengths. So. How can our institutions respond to these challenges? Enter Universal Design for Learning, or UDL for short. UDL is an educational framework that guides the design of learning goals, materials, methods and assessments, as well as the policies surrounding these curricular elements with the diversity of learners in mind. The framework was developed by US organization CAST and is based on research in the field of neuroscience promotes three core principles for educators to build into their teaching practice, calling on them to provide students with multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. The framework includes a set of guidelines on how you can turn these principles into practice, for example, by fostering collaboration with the introduction of group work with clear goals, roles, and responsibilities, by using different types of media to support learning, and ensuring that all materials are accessible, and by providing a choice of assessment instruments while maintaining robust learning outcomes. You are probably already including some UDL elements in your practice without realising it, and there's much more to explore, so don't be afraid to let Universal Design for Learning give you a new lens through which to look at your teaching and learning practice and help you to better reach all of your students. For more information and resources, visit ahead.ie slash UDL. So I really like this video because when I started first thinking about ADA compliance, I really thought of it as sort of a checklist of things I had to memorize and get exactly right. But I think a more fruitful way to think of it is as if you're a designer and you can kind of be creative, think outside the box, stop teaching just the way you've always taught it, rethink how could I reach every single person who's gonna walk into my room, no matter who they are or what their background is. And I think when you kind of start from that place, you can start to be a little bit inspired and excited about what it is we're trying to do as instructors. Oh, sorry, okay. So who benefits from universal design? Well, many people usually, and often people we don't initially expect, um, but to make sure none of our students are left stranded on the, on the curb, so to speak, we need to be thinking about who might be left out of full access to our course materials. 
So when we think about accessibility, there's four groups that are great to start with. So students with vision impairment, students with hearing impairment, students with mobility impairment. And by mobility, definitely this includes something like a wheelchair or a cane, but it could include something like arthritis, where somebody's just struggling to type or write. Um, it can mean lots of different things. And then students with learning differences. And often when we design for them, we find that we help others as well. So I wanna show you one other video. I'm not gonna show you the full video of this, but I, I think it's really powerful. And so I'd like to show you six minutes of this TED Talk um, by Elise Roy. I'll never forget the sound of laughing with my friends. I'll never forget the sound of my mother's voice right before I fell asleep. And I'll never forget the comforting sound of water trickling down a stream. Imagine my fear, pure fear, when at the age of 10, I was told I was going to lose my hearing. And over the next five years, it progressed until I was classified as profoundly deaf. But I believe that losing my hearing was one of the greatest gifts that I've ever received. You see, I get to experience the world in a unique way. And I believe that these unique experiences that people with disabilities have is what's going to help us make and design a better world for everyone, both for people with and without disabilities. Now, I used to be a disability rights lawyer, and I spent a lot of my time focused on enforcing the law, ensuring that accommodations were made. And then I had to quickly learn international policy because I was asked to work on the UN Convention that protects people with disabilities. As the leader of the NGO there, I spent most of my energy trying to convince people about the capabilities of people with disabilities. But somewhere along the way, and after many career transitions that my parents weren't so happy about, <laughs> I stumbled upon a solution that I believe may be an even more powerful tool to solve some of the world's greatest problems, disability or not. And that tool is called design thinking. Design thinking is a process for innovation and problem solving. There are five steps. The first is defining the problem and understanding its constraints. The second is observing people in real life situations and empathizing with them. Third, throwing out hundreds of ideas. The more the better, the wilder the better. Fourth, prototyping, gathering whatever you can, whatever you can find to mimic your solution, to test it and to refine it. And finally, implementation, ensuring that the solution you came up with is sustainable. Warren Berger says that design thinking teaches us to look sideways, to reframe, to refine, to experiment, and probably most importantly, ask those stupid questions. Design thinkers believe that everyone is creative. They believe in bringing people from multiple disciplines together because they want to share multiple perspectives and bring them together and ultimately merge them to form something new. Design thinking is such a successful and versatile tool that has been applied in almost every industry. I saw the potential that it had for the issues that I faced, so I decided to go back to school 
and get my master's in social design. This looks at how to use design to create positive change in the world. While I was there, I fell in love with woodworking. But what I quickly realized was that I was missing out on something. As you're working with a tool, right before it's about to kick back at you, which means the piece or the tool jumps back at you, it makes a sound. And I couldn't hear this sound. So I decided, why not try and solve it? My solution was a pair of safety glasses that were engineered to visually alert the user to pitch changes in the tool before the human ear could pick it up. Why hadn't tool designers thought of this before? <laughs> Two reasons. One. Oh, I'm so sorry. Hold on. Oh, sorry about that. Let me see if I can find the right spot. Here. People from multiple I'm thinking it's such a successful and versatile tool. Sorry, Design guys. thinkers believe sideways. <laughs> believe that everyone is together and get my masters in oh such successful Sorry. and versatile tool that has been applied. Where were the glasses? Sorry, guys. I, oh, here they are. I have safety Sorry. glasses that were engineered to visually alert the user to pitch changes in the tool before the human ear could pick it up. Why hadn't Tool designers thought of this before. <laughs> Two reasons. One, I was a beginner. I wasn't weighed down by expertise or conventional wisdom. The second is I was deaf. My unique experience of the world helped inform my solution. And as I went on, I kept running into more and more solutions that were originally made for people with disabilities and that ended up being picked up, embraced, and loved by the mainstream, disability or not. This is the OXO potato peeler. It was originally designed for people with arthritis, but it was so comfortable, everybody loved it. <laughs> Text messaging. That was originally designed for people who are deaf. And as you know, everybody loves that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I started thinking, what if we changed our mindset? What if we started designing for disability first, not the norm? As you've seen, when we design for disability first, we often stumble upon solutions that are not only inclusive, but also are often better than those when we design for the norm. And this excites me, because this means that the energy it takes to accommodate someone with a disability can be leveraged, molded, and played with as a force for creativity and innovation. This moves us from the mindset of trying to change the hearts and the deficiency mindset of tolerance to becoming an alchemist, the type of magician that this world so desperately needs to solve some of its greatest problems. Now so I really found this very inspiring, and that's why I wanted to share it with you. Um, let me see if I can go to the next screen here. Um, and I would encourage you to watch the whole TED Talk if you have time. When I send you into breakout rooms, I'll find the link for you and I'll put it in chat. But I just loved this quote, that what if we started designing for disability first, not the norm? And also this thought that we become almost like a magician you know, trying to solve these problems of how do we reach every single student that could walk into our classroom. I just really love that, that mindset frame. And I was thinking about something like, for instance, captions. You know, and we think about using captions in our videos for students who are hard of hearing or deaf, but think for a second about who else might benefit for them, such as a student who speaks multiple languages and benefits from seeing the words spelled out. Um, someone who might have dyslexia and needs the reinforcement of spelling. Um, 
think about a parent who is their child is on virtual kindergarten and two dogs are barking while they're trying to watch the video you're showing them. All of those people benefit from captions. Um, so I think really, if we start by designing for disability, we'll find all these cool things that we can do for all of our students. So one acronym that you may hear a lot with universal design is POUR. So P-O-U-R, like pouring a glass of water. The P stands for perceivable. The O stands for operable. The U stands for understandable. And the R stands for robust. So in terms of perceivable, I realize I have a runaway bullet here. Pretend that's not here. Um, some of the things that you want to think about is, is your material actually perceivable to every student, regardless of whether they might have a hearing impairment or a visual impairment or um, be struggle to use a keyboard because of arthritis? Um, so some of the things you can do to make your, your Canvas courses or your online courses perceivable is provide text alternatives for non-text content. So I remember back in the day when I would just sort of screenshot things and put that right in my shell. Well, that's a problem for someone who's visually impaired because a screen reader can't read an image. So I have to provide a text alternative if I wanna do that. I need to provide captions and other alternatives for multimedia in case the student can't hear or see what, what it is that I'm talking about. Um, I need to create content that can be presented in different ways, including by assistive technologies, which we'll talk about a little bit later, without losing meaning, and to make it easier for users to see and hear content. Oh, and I see Doris had a comment here that I'm going to read. This approach to design has been widely used in our human efforts at space exploration. Everything is designed to accommodate the conditions in space. That's a great addition. Thank you so much, Doris. And yeah, I mean, I think what's exciting about this is it, you really do have to be creative. You have to think not just about what you would want or what people like you would want, but what would work for everyone in every condition. And it's a big challenge, but it's kind of exciting. So for operable, you want to make sure that someone can use the functionality from a keyboard. And I think for a lot of online classes, that's going to be the case, but it might not be for all. And just remember, you know, somebody with mobility issues and not just talking about someone in a wheelchair, but maybe someone who's struggling to move their arms or their hands or their fingers, they need to be able to do those things that you want them to do with a keyboard and a mouse. Um, so if you're requiring your students to handwrite things, you know, that, that might be something to think about and then upload it or something. And then you want to give users enough time to read and use content um, because everything takes longer. For instance, if I can only type with one or two fingers um, or I have some other kind of potential disability, you need to build in enough time. Um, you don't want to use content that auto plays because, you know, that can be sort of um, shocking and distracting also if somebody might have um, a, a, like a visual disability. And you also want to avoid things that are flashing a lot and could cause seizures. Um, and then in terms of designing your class, you want users to be able to navigate and find content. So y your you know sidebar navigation is really important. It needs to be as clear as possible. It shouldn't have repetition in terms of um, the way things are labeled. And there should be consistency, which we'll get into a little bit in the next one as well. But for instance, I'm an English teacher, so I have four essays. It's confusing if I call them essay one, paper two, assignment three, and capstone four, right? I, it would be a lot easier for my students if I said paper one, paper two, paper three, paper four, and they were always located in an easy to find place. So you're really thinking about making your, what you, your course as operable as possible to every single person who walks in the room. And then of course, understandable. 
So the text needs to be readable. So, you know, we're not going to get too much into the nitty gritty, but for instance, if there's not enough color contrast between your background and your text, it's not going to be readable. Or if you're only designating meaning through color, what if you have someone who's colorblind? So you need to make your text readable and understandable to everyone. Um, I kind of already talked about this one, but you want them make, to make the content appear and operate in predictable ways. So you don't want to name things five different ways. You don't want every module to look completely different from the last one. There should be some consistency to make it easier for the user. Um, you also want to provide help for users to avoid incorrect mistakes. Sometimes provide definitions, um, suggest tutorials, point them to tutoring services in your campus. All of these things are going to help make your content more understandable. Um, Nadra, let me think about that when you're in the breakout room. I might have a good one that I can show you from my course. Can you stop? Can you stop? Oh, did you need something? Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the R is robust. So you want to maximize compatibility with current and future user tools. And kind of the brief thing I'll say about this is that when you can, it's good to use HTML. And what I mean by that is that when you can create something as a Canvas page, that is kind of the ideal because everyone has different devices, computers, laptops, iPads, phones. And um, when it's in HTML, it's going to adjust and it's also going to work better with a lot of assistive technology. Yes, if you properly format a Word document or a PDF, you, you can also get, you know, compatibility. But I think you should, when you can, try to really use Canvas pages and that HTML because it just works with pretty much everything. And then um, if you happen to find something that just isn't accessible or it's it's not working for certain learners, try to come up with an equivalent experience. So say you can do either X or Y. Um, in other words, just provide another way that students can kind of get to the same goal. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and in terms of practically how you do this, it's really just three steps. Um, that or you know you could do some of them or all of them. You can create resources completely from scratch and sometimes that clean slate can be really helpful in being creative. Um, you can retrofit your existing materials. So for instance, I retrofitted a class this summer and I think it took me about 20 hours and I didn't do it all at once and I spread it out over a couple of days. But you know I had a bunch of things in Word and in in PowerPoint and the things that didn't need to be in those formats, I changed them over to pages and I made sure they had proper headings and that everything had captions, including pictures having alt text. Um, and then the last thing is there is a lot of accessible content out there. So we're all usually curating content outside of ourselves that we find online or from other teachers. And that's fine, but you want to also put that content through sort of the same lens of, is this accessible? If it's not, I need to fix it, or I can find a similar resource that is accessible. Okay, so what I want to do now, and let me just see if I can pull this up. I want to give you the universal design <coughs> handout. So I'm going to try to drag it into chat here. Oops, let me see if I can give it to everybody here. Okay. Let me try this one more time. Sorry, it's being a little weird here. Give me a second. Can you tell me, is that just coming up as the name rather than the actual file in the chat, anyone? Can someone look in the chat and see if you can? It looks like it's the name. Okay, it, maybe it's just the name here, let me I see. Was, I was able to download it. Oh, you were? You were able to? 
I was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you each take a minute in the chat to just click that link? And what should come up is a, uh, a one page PDF that looks like this. This is sort of the smaller version. So I don't want you to have to read off of this. Um, so if everyone could go to the chat for a second and try to click on what I just put in there. And if you're having issues, just let me know. Yeah, I can't do it. Could you try again, please? Y yeah, of course. Hold on here. Hmm. Okay. Let me try one more time. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Hold on. Okay, here we go. I think this should work. Okay, try now. Work. Yeah, it's in the chat. Sorry, I think I, I think the file should be there now. Universal design for learning. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, what I just wanted to do was have everybody um, download this. And then what I'd like to do is briefly put you in breakout rooms and discuss some things that you might be able to, we'll talk through it and discuss if there's anything that this kind of inspires you to do in your own classroom. So the changes that you might be able to make and um, or that this makes you wonder if you could make to improve your instruction. Um, and then if you can just sort of as a group, you know, come up with a few ideas of things you might be able to do in a classroom to sort of make um, this universal design for learning happen. And then if you could just choose a person, any person in the group to share out a couple items when we come back. Uh, do those instructions make sense? Yes. yes? Okay, great. Um, let me go ahead and stop screen sharing just for a minute. And I'm going to go ahead and put you into breakout rooms. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to open all the rooms. So you should be invited to join a breakout room. And I'm going to give you about five minutes to discuss this. So you should get a little invite that invites you to the breakout room. So just to accept that and then you should be able to go. And then Anna and AA, if you can hear me, um, hopefully you uh, got invited to a breakout group. You may just have to click to accept it. Anna, are you able to get into the breakout room?
Hi there. Hello. So Hi. I, I was here, but then I have to leave because I had it. Uh, I needed to take a call. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. So it looks like you. I tried to invite you to room five. Okay. Okay, welcome back everybody. I'm just gonna give everyone a couple of seconds to come back. Welcome back, just hang tight for a minute. Okay, I think we're almost ready. Give it about 15 more seconds. We shall be back. Thanks for your patience. Okay. All right, welcome back everybody. Um, hopefully you were able to have some good discussions um, is there someone from room one? And that was Adam, Doris, NK, Drake, MM, John, and Larissa. Would one of you be willing to share a little bit about your discussion? Well, I'll, I'll speak. Um, our discussion took a while to get started. And then when we get started, we talked a lot about um, students and the, the differences in their learning styles and their speeds and how we are trying to make adjustments and trying to keep it equal for those that don't have disabilities with those that do have disabilities and the challenges they have with each other trying to say well i'm ready they're not ready i'm ready to move ahead they're not ready to move ahead and how do we how do we get both of them prepared for a real world uh, application from the classroom. Absolutely, it's it's it is complex. It's a challenge. So so looking at these, you know, how how do they engage? How do they use the tools that we have available to them? How proficient are they at using them? And how do they um, gain better proficiency independently? Are challenges. Absolutely. Thank you, Adam. And if any of you don't know Adam, he's in our LA Mission uh, DSPS office. And Adam, is there anything that you um, would like to add to what I've said so far? Is there anything that you think I've, I've missed or misspoken about that you would want to add? No, I think you're right on track. And I, I, I think this is a great uh, information seminar for us as educators to, um, we always try and think with an open mind, but to now try kind of like a take a, a sidestep on another world that we know is in our classroom and we try and accommodate, but there are, it is always room for us to be exposed to new elements. And I think this, this program is gonna do that so that at least we know, just like the student, you know what, there's another resource that I haven't tapped on. I need to go back and take a look at that. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much, room one. Thank you, Adam. 
So room two was Contrano, Mitch, Rita, uh, Sanchuk two, and Sheila. Would one of you be able to share what your discussion? Hi. So we actually, we, we kind of got cut off in the middle of our discussion, but I did want to bring one of the questions that they asked to the group. So one of our, one of our instructors is a kinesiology instructor. And so in her videos, she worries about how is she supposed to express movement to people who are visually impaired when it is a video. And so I kind of want to like answer her question and like share with the group as well. So I, I oftentimes I think about like YouTube videos. And so there are, there are certain like tutorials that they, they, they give you only like words to like go by. And so then if it's a makeup tutorial, they're like, you need to do this specifically. So I feel like if you're trying to express movement, you have to make sure that you're speaking and you're directing like every single part of your body. So let's say you're, you're trying to do a push up. So then you're gonna make sure you tell them, keep your hands to shoulder width apart, flat to the floor, make sure your legs are close together and straight. And so you have to make sure that you're explaining every aspect of the actual movement because you are a kinesiology instructor, you already know what it pulls on, what you're working out. So you just need to make sure that you're, you're giving them, they have no visual like experience depending on when they lost their sight or if they didn't have it at all. So then having that, that you're going to like giving using their their body exactly in your description will give them more of an idea and so then that was one of the things that we talked about also um just making sure that some of us are unaware or unsure about how to make sure we're, we're assisting our students to the, their best capacity and some of us do do the things that you've already spoken about like making sure that our titles are the same for each assignment or each week and then we're trying our best to make sure that they they look and sound similar so that there's no confusion. Some some instructors actually spoke about the the time that it took them to, to curate a course online and how it's not an easy feat. And sometimes like right now we're, we're kind of floundering on making that move to online and it could take months and months and we're, we're expected to do this on the fly. And so some of that, those are some of the issues we covered and some of the questions we had. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was such a good summary and a really, um, a really great answer to how to try to do that complex task of translating movements. Like I, I can't, you know, think about how hard it must be to teach yoga, uh, you know, and describe it perfectly. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, room three was Adrian, Carol, Nedra, Sheila, and Wesley. Would one of you be willing to share? Anybody? Well, I'll, I'll step up. Okay. Um, I just um, learned uh, or and, and just got confirmation uh, from Adrian about using uh, closed, uh, the, the, I get that confused, the caption, captioning. Like the closed captioning? Yes, and I already use it. I already make sure to use it. And I just forget that I did, but I do. And the other thing was uh, the transcription in the Zoom. So I, I have gone in there a couple of times to edit the, uh, uh, the text in the Zoom because it, it doesn't always qu quite say exactly what you know, people are saying. But um, I, I was so grateful just to hear him call, call that out because it helps me to make my class more of a, you know, I want to, be able to complement every learning skill. But, and then I like what I heard about someone saying, for those who don't have those challenges, we wanna to try to make sure that we meet all of those needs. But again, as another, the, the uh, kinesiologist instructor um, just mentioned, it, it is a little bit of a challenge to do these very meaningful um, things on the fly <laughs> it's absolutely yeah i i got that was very powerful for me so i'll be quiet now thank you no no thank you and it is it's a very heavy lift at a time when we're doing a lot of heavy lifting right in 2020 to to kind of master this but i think you know e each little bit that we learn um, is helpful in that process. And one of the things I probably should have said at the beginning and I forgot was that this is part of a series. So this is really just the first week. And then next Tuesday, same time, we're gonna do Canvas pages, making them accessible. 
Next, the week after that will be documents and the week after that will be videos. So hopefully we'll get to dive a little deeper. Um, but thank you so much, Nadra. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Um, sorry if I'm not. Um, Adrian is also a member of our DSPS office at LA Mission College and, and both him and Adam have been wonderful in helping me. Um, Adrian, is there anything you want to add to what we've discussed so far? Oh, I think you're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, there you go. Sorry. I, I think it's important that um, to keep in mind uh, and, and as we're teaching, um, uh, think of it of uh, describing what the, the person, you know, in the athletic, describing to a visual uh, student. It's the same th same way when you're describing to a deaf student. And uh, per se, for instance, um, someone that uses the whiteboard a lot, um, make sure you're facing the student directly before you write something on the whiteboard. Same thing on Zoom. Look at the student or face the camera as you're, uh, it's, you know, it describing something that you're teaching or providing the, le the lesson, uh, it helps those who are visual, uh, but also deaf and hard of hearing can understand because they rely heavily on, on the lip reading. So, so make sure you're not moving around like facing a, like your second uh, monitor that we sometimes have access to, right? And, but you're not facing the camera directly, the student who is deaf or hard of hearing needs rely heavily you know, on, on you uh, to understand uh, your, your, um, your lesson. Thank you so much, Adrian. I really appreciate that. And I really appreciate the support of the DSPS office. And I should also Say thank you to Al, our DE coordinator, for his support for for these for the series as well. Um, okay, so let's move to Group Four, which was John, Joni, Kay, and Trinidad. Would one of you be willing to briefly share what you talked about? All right, so I I will be our speaker because I have to leave since I have office hours. But we talked about really our conversation started about uh, our fear, I guess, of accessibility. And then really sort of just diving in and we talked about different instances in which we've used accessibility. So I know for myself, I, you know, I looked at um, the things I'm doing in Canvas and the great thing about Canvas is that it sort of prompts you when you're not accessible. And I love it because then as a teacher, you know, I want excellence from my students and I also want excellence from myself. And so when I'm not 100% and I'm finding ways to be 100%, so that, that, you know, that stems from something as simple as my syllabus where I'm having to label my images, you know, and then also looking back at my headings. And because I had a student this semester who did need accommodations and it was challenging for me to be able to meet those, but I needed to meet them, not just because of Title V or not because of just state laws, because of what you said earlier, it needs to be accessible for everyone. One. And so when I downloaded a reading, for instance, it was sort of just a hard copy, but because she has issues, the student with reading, I was able to download a copy that was an immersive reader for her so that she can have that additional tool. And so that it makes it equitable. And it's not just about accessibility, it's also about equity and what's equitized, you know, within uh, our classrooms as well. So I use Canva, for instance, to um, to uh, produce my syllabus or to work on my syllabus and it has accessibility features, then I'm able to go through every single image and heading in order to construct those things. And even the features I didn't even know that we had at our disposal, you know, through Canvas, through our Word documents, where I'm learning all of these things, because that was one of my goals is I want to be 100%. Right now, I'm, I'm between 50 and 75% in terms of accessibility, but I want to be 100 because it's what our students 
kids need. And so, you know, some folks mentioned the, the captioning for the video. So I make sure all the videos are captioned and that's, you know, a really good piece. Uh, Zoom, having the transcripts available, making sure that I'm giving transcripts to our students as well who need that additional help. So I think it's making me more cognizant, especially because Canvas constantly prompts you Hey, this isn't accessible and you get, you know, the little checker, is it green? Is it red? It's like, no, you know, I want to be in the, the green. <laughs> I want to be in the red. And so then for that reason, I, I think it helps us to be more mindful. And so, you know, I think it's, I think we all talked about it's a work in progress and we're all willing to do what's necessary in order to equitize things for, for our students. So that's what we had. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. That was a really wonderful summary and just really, kind of a, a beautiful way of just saying why this is so valuable from the equity side of really making sure we reach all of our students. And I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, in my room five was Anna A. Lopez Fernandez, Mitzi and Tin. Would one of you be willing to summarize your discussion? Anybody? All right. <clears throat> to tell you the truth, we didn't have time to discuss because uh, I personally read this thing very slowly and thoroughly because this is my first encounter with accessibility matter. And it is a lot, a lot of information. And what slows me down also that mentally I read a line and then I said, oh, this is check. All right, you know, because you intuitively trying to accommodate students even without, you know, good knowledge of all the laws and regulations, but you're still trying to do it. And so, so I would say that I'm between like C plus and B minus here. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think a lot of <laughs> us are. Yes, yeah. I self-evaluate myself. And since I'm talking, may I ask a question that oh, I sure. have with one of my classes? Sure. Because you guys are experts. And this is my first semester doing uh, remote teaching because I took semester off last semester when you all struggled for the, with this thing for the first time. So for me, it's like, you know, like a truck. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> more or less, my style of teaching is that I communicate with students all the time. I ask them questions and I'm trying, you know, to engage them in discussion. So strictly speaking, I am not lecturing. I am kind of discussing with them the ideas and solving problems together. So I was successful in all my classes except one. So this one class, they just refused to talk to me, you know? So I see their mics are all uh, muted, you know? And I'm trying to get something from them. And the best I can do, they write it in the chat area, you know? Like, do you have an explanation of psychology of this situation? Um, I mean, I and other people can speak to this too. I, I think what's hard, one thing that, I mean, it is possible that some students are just checked out, but I think just as often there can be Wi-Fi issues. Like I know in my house when I'm streaming, my son is also streaming for LAUSD and sometimes my husband is streaming for work. And so sometimes it's difficult to stream my video or my audio if all of them are going at the same time. Um, I think also some of our students are, you know, unhoused and maybe in shelters where it's not really appropriate for them to show video or it would uh, reveal too much. No, I'm not asking them about video, N never. Oh, said, okay. You may not, you may not uh, turn on your video, but when I'm asking you a question, if you know what I'm asking, please answer. And if you don't understand, please say, I don't understand. Say something, Yeah. you know? 
I mean, it's hard. It's hard looking at the black boxes. I, I am also looking at them a lot of my life. There is something called Flipgrid that I'm using in a course called Humanizing Online Instruction, where you can have a conversation that's asynchronous. So it could be that your students need more time to think about the question, or maybe they're hit, hitting on a vocabulary word that they don't understand. Um, it might kind of change your style um, to, to do it more of an asynchronous uh and it's a it can be video or audio discussion but does anyone else have want to chime in with any other ideas or solutions i think i could uh could suggest to it we're really dealing definitely with a, a wide range of students who who really don't maybe really want to talk um one of the things to do is not only then uh maybe pose you know, we you, we have groups, you can put them into chat groups, right? But the other thing to use possibly is whiteboard, where they simply, and you're teaching them a tool, and you could start with very simple questions and say, okay, everybody write down like a word association or whatever, and mm -hmm. engaged with actually writing on the whiteboard will be easier perhaps for a lot of students than speaking. And, oh, you know, may I ask you right away, how do I give them this option to write on the whiteboard? Okay, that would be something you would want to get some training on. And I would just, first of all, get with your, your uh, DE people right away and say, uh, help me clue into this. Uh, of course, another thing is just to put Canvas whiteboard uh, instructions and see what flies up there. Or Z if you're using Zoom, uh, Zoom instructions um, because there is, uh, there are tutorials on how to use whiteboard. I, well, I personally use whiteboard all the time. I'm saying how I delegate to students the whiteboard that everybody can see. Uh huh. Right. And learning how to put the whiteboard up in Zoom is, you know, is a tool. It's a share. It's part of share screen. You see at the very bottom of our um, our icons. Started right. right. I right. share screen. And this is how they can see what I write. Exactly. Exactly. Write. And you can turn it over to them then, as co-hosts. I believe that's the method where you enable them. Okay. Okay. Probably I will go to Zoom and figure it out. Right. Yeah. Well, and call your DE people. You know. Of course. Thank you very very much for your advice. Sure. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for, really for your help with that, Doris. Um, okay, so I know we need to wrap up here. So let me go ahead and share again here. Uh, let's see, slideshow. Um, okay. Okay, so um, some of the new standards for accessibility um, have been developed through the OEI uh, rubric, Online Education Initiative, and Section D deals with accessibility. It's uh, very dense, so I don't have time to go through it um, just in this hour and a half that we have, but some of the things that it covers um, include standards for content pages are D1, oops, sorry, D1 through D7, sorry, um, and it deals with heading styles, lists, links, tables, color contrast, color and meaning, and images. Um, and like I said, we'll talk about this more next Tuesday. And then standards for files deal with all those things, plus digital reading order, digital presentations, PDFs, and spreadsheets. And then the standards for multimedia, which like in our last week, I was saying we'll talk about videos. That's going to deal with audio and video, live content, sorry, live broadcast, autoplay, flashing content, and instructional materials inventory. Um, a few last definitions just to think about. Um, you may hear AT, which stands for assistive technology. And this refers to a broad spectrum of devices and softwares that can be useful to people with disabilities. So an example would be a screen reader that reads the text to the user, a screen magnifier that helps them see the text larger, speech recognition, which is gonna transcribe their speech to text, alternative keyboard access where they get to use a modified keyboard or what I have a picture of here, a refreshable braille display where it's gonna turn the text into braille. So there's all kinds of really cool technology out there to assist individuals with disabilities. 
the other term you need to know is alternative media. Um, and this ensures the format chosen for something works seamlessly with assistive technology. So it can be a little confusing at first to difference, but you can help your students assistive technology work best if you provide visual and oral material and formats that integrate with the AT being used. For example, when I used to use screenshots of things, that is not an, a media that works with a screen reader because there's no text, it's just an image. So if the student has a learning um, disability and they use text to, text to speech software, they need text, not graphics or screenshots. And just in terms of understanding the difference, thinking back to our very first story about the curb, right, in Kalamazoo. So before um, Jack Fisher made those changes and advocated for veterans, for someone with mobility issues, a curb was the inaccessible material. Um, the assistive technology that was helping them with their disability was the wheelchair and the alternative media that helped them use that assistive technology was the curb cut that eventually became very widespread. So I know we don't have a lot of time, so I apologize. I know we're kind of covering a lot of material here in a short amount of time, um, but You've probably seen accommodation letters um, if you've taught for a couple of semesters at least. And when you get one of those, that's going to describe an alteration of the environment, curriculum format, or equipment that's going to allow an individual with a disability to gain access to content and or complete assigned tasks. So one of the very common ones is that a student may need more time. Time and a half is I've seen a lot. Sometimes I've seen double time could be all kinds of reasons for this, but sometimes it can be as simple as somebody has um, a, a type of arthritis that makes it difficult to type or to type quickly, um, or they need some other kind of assistive technology. And it is pretty, luckily it's pretty easy in Canvas to make that change. How to do that is kind of another tutorial on its own. Um, but, but Joni, like you were saying, um, there are a lot of things in Canvas, luckily, that make this a lot easier, like the accessibility checker, than it was even two or three years ago. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Um, other types of accommodations, oops, sorry, that can be made um, is that you can consider when it's appropriate, sorry, giving students more chances. Um, and it's up to you, depending on what the content is and and etc. But for instance, for me, for a lot of my quizzes, I give students unlimited attempts. Now, I understand not everybody wants to do that. But that was something my chair at the time recommended because some students benefit from the repetition of being able to try over and over again. So that may be something you want to consider for, for low, lower stakes testing, more attempts. Um, another thing is sometimes just having an alternative. Um, where a student can do A or B and both A and B are going to sort of result in the same um, practice of a skill or the same outcome. Um, and yes, I will put the link to the accessibility class in as well. It's a four week class. It's great. I totally recommend it. Um, okay. What are some resources that are available to faculty? So your local DSPS program is front and center and I'm so glad Adrian and Adam were able to join us because they are going to be very helpful to you because they know your unique students. There is a statewide program and you can check out their website as well. Um, but it's great to check out to your, reach out to your local DSPS uh, um, you know, team first. Um, if you're in LA Mission College, I uploaded the shells from the class uh, because they're, they're, you can do that through the Commons license. So if you're at LAMC and you're in our Faculty Learning Center, just go to modules and scroll near the bottom and you'll be able to find all the content there in a lot more detail than I can provide in an hour and a half. Um, and yes, Adam, I, I tried to upload my PowerPoint while you were in groups. I don't know if you can scroll up and see it. If you can't, I'll upload it again. Um, I would also recommend checking out the California Community College, Colleges Accessibility Center and the Online Education Initiative. And let me actually see if I can switch for just a minute to my browser. Let me see if I can find this. Uh, okay, hold on. Because I just wanted to show you. If you go to at one, looks like this, Online Network of Educators, 
you just want to go to courses. And if you've never done, I mean, I'm sure most of you probably done the introductory courses. If you hadn't, haven't, I would recommend doing those. But if you scroll down here to online teaching and design, you can see um, creating accessible course content. Oh, sorry. Let me make this normal view again. And let me actually go ahead and copy this, throw it in the chat. Okay. Um, and like I said, $85, but I think a lot of us get half of that reimbursed. There is a self-paced program, but personally for something this complex, I like to have it guided. Um, it's not loading right now, which I think maybe they just don't have a class access, uh, running right now. It's, they just finished the one that I was working on with them. But in a, a couple of weeks, I would check back. They seem to run them pretty often. Um, okay. Oh, and somebody was asking about OERs, and I kind of got that mixed up with OEI in my head for a second, but I do have a resource here for an OER checklist. Yes, please. <laughs> okay. That would be yeah, yes. And I remember, I'm sorry. So it's this MSU library link. They have a really good checklist of how to figure out if your OER is accessible. Um, and then we're almost done here. We're not going to have time, uh, I'm realizing, to go over some of the questions that I was thinking we might. But let me just show you um, one last thing, which is this is a big process, but I would recommend creating an accessibility plan. So just like if you were dreaming, you know, building your dream house, you'd work from a blueprint first. So before you start changing everything, it's it's not bad to make a plan. And so what they recommend in the at one class is that, you know, you start with one unit, you write a unit description, um, and then you do a resource inventory. And I tried to upload it while you were in groups. There's a template and I, I also uploaded mine, but if it doesn't show for you, I'll upload them all in a second as well. Um, but it looks something like this. Ah, sorry. Um, basically you go through, you know, everything in your unit, what kind of resource it is, the link to where it is and what you need to do to make it accessible. And it, it does take a while, but it kind of gives you a place to start and then you can kind of start checking things off the list little by little as you go. So um, are people able to scroll up? Can you tell me in the chat, if you scroll up, can you see what is accessibility.ppt and template or no? I don't see it there, Karen. Okay, thank you. All right, so maybe it didn't show up because um, I did it while you were in. Uh, in the breakout rooms. So let me upload them again right now. Um, the PowerPoint's kind of big, so it just takes a second. Um, but I also have this template that you can use for accessibility. And then I'm also attaching, uh, let's see, um, the one that I did, just so you can see an example um, of a unit. So hopefully um, the, the PowerPoint's still loading right now, but it'll go through in a minute. Um, and then you can craft an accessibility statement. Now I was able to work with Adam and Adrian um, in our DSPS office and create one for mission um, that is updated for the fact that we're all virtual. So that's in our faculty learning center. But for those of you who are at other schools, you may wanna reach out to your office and say, hey, do we have updated instructions for our new online world? And if we don't, can we craft some together? And then, um, if you haven't explored accessibility support for faculty, start exploring it. Get to know the DSPS team at your school. Get to know your DE coordinator. Um, and like I said, think about at one, you can also ask your department, um, depending on what your, how involved your department is and things like this, so, or your dean. So don't be afraid to ask for help because everyone's really trying to figure it out at the same time. And, and it is hard. Now, we don't have time to go over these questions, but just something to think about as you leave. Um, think about what might be some discipline-specific accessibility issues you might face, because those might be really good to talk about in your next discipline meeting. And then what are some learning challenges or accessibility issues that you think your learners face right now? 
A few other things to think about are what questions do you still have about federal and state regulations? And if you have a lot, that's okay. There's a lot to learn um, and we'll learn it a little bit at a time. What worries or fears do you have? What challenges do you think you might face? And what do you think you will need help with? And those are kind of just uh, places to start thinking about. And um, of course, the goal is not only complying with law, but really reaching every single one of our students. So it, it, is a, it is a big mountain to climb, but it is worth it. Um, so I really wanna thank you all again for joining. Um, hopefully everything loaded in the chat bar. Um, here's my email, crozerkj at laccd.edu. Uh, feel free to reach out. I may not have all the answers, but if I don't have the answers, I'll try to find someone who does. And um, I would absolutely love to um, have all of you um, join me again next Tuesday, if you are able to. Um, we're gonna go into a deep dive of, um, you know, basically how to make Sorry, I have to take a screenshot of everyone really fast. Um, how to make everything accessible in a content page. Then week after that, we're gonna go into making, you know, other files like, you know, PDFs or Word documents accessible. And then in that final week in December, when we're all just limping across the finish line for 2020, we're gonna go over video captioning. So I'm here, if you can make it, that's awesome. If you can't, you can reach out over email. Um, and I really appreciate you spending your time here and opening up about uh, what you're thinking about in your classes. So thank you so much for attending. And if there's anything else you need, I'll stay on for a little bit longer in case there are questions that I might be able to answer. Um, and I wish you all a good rest of your day because take, take care of yourselves because 2020, man, it's rough. So um, I wish you all the best and it's, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Hi, right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I had a question. Um, Dr. Crozier? Yes. Yeah, Nedra Wheeler here. Yeah, the OER, I um I I uh, downloaded a uh, book on music, understanding music past and present. And what I found was if I I um I wasn't really sure how to go about using it. I, I thought it'd be okay to just capture a couple of chapters uh, and put it into the rich text editor. But what I found was when I clicked on to the accessibility um, icon to just see if things were lined up correctly, um, what I ran into were the um, uh, things that were not in a, how do you say, uh, it has to, things, certain things have to be in a column, in a grid or a cell. Mm. Yeah. yeah, when you're using a table, you have to, yeah. um, since tables can be read from top to bottom or left to right, right. you have to right. canvas which way you want it read, which can be a little complicated. So, so I guess in, in short, I just wanted to know, um, what are we allowed to use? I mean, um, I know some of the images carry over, some of the audio carries over. Uh, all of the text, most of the text carries over, but at some point the Canvas window will will not allow you to put so much of the material in there. And then I wasn't really sure if we were able to actually, you, you know, are we allowed to use that material? I mean, because it belongs to the writer, but they said it was okay to use it. So I'm not, it's very unclear how to use that OER. Yeah. Adrian or Adam, do you have any advice on this one? As far as uh, the OER, and that's what you're saying, as far as the OER? Yes, it's the um, uh, educational um, uh, material, the, the books that have been approved that we are allowed to use. Yes. And um, I, I wasn't really quite sure if we were allowed to to print, you know, some of the uh, chat a uh, chapter. Not, I just choose some excerpts, you know, and and then I write some material to try to. I don't want to really use the some other writer's material, basically. Right. Um, I think it if it's for 
is it for your class or is it for a, or a particular DSDS student? Uh, um, it's for my class and the only, I, I may have had maybe two students who just needed more time. So they didn't specifically say, you know, what their challenge was. So I don't, I didn't know that. I, I, I'm not sure how o, OER is uh, done at your particular school. Uh, you know, it may, you may approach who's the, the coordinator of, of the OER uh, in charge of for your campus, you may approach that person. But I think uh, we are able to grab different text uh, uh, pages that you want to uh, share um, because you're not, you're not, uh, are you, you're not printing, right? You're not, um, no, no, it's just uh, posted in your canvas and I think it should be, it should be okay. Really? Oh, that's, that's. Because, uh, is your class OER or not? Um, let, let me see. I'm using a book that was a, on the OER list that it was approved that we could use in Canvas. So if I'm if I want the students to read about Baroque music or let's say opera, yeah, go ahead. Then I'll select maybe a couple of paragraphs, you know, on the on a style of music called the oratorio. Let's say. And you post and you post that in your Canvas. Uh, yes, I will post it in the canvas. I will post an audio. I will post a biography. Um, and then I will try to do um, some kind of an activity. I, I mean, as long as you have it available in a, uh, when it, as, you know, a DSPS student needs it, uh, if that's available, you know, at the square of the moment, I, I, it's doable. It should be okay. Okay, and then um, I also will type in an alternative um, description. You know, if there's a, you know, there's um, a, like a painting on the Mona Lisa or something like that. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm jumping around from different that, periods. That should be okay as long as you're uh, communicating that to to the OER coordinator because I I believe each campus has one uh, and. Consult with that person, but I think for now you're doing everything in your power to be inclusive, right? Uh, and and that's that's the key. Okay, thank you. I was really stressing out about it because I I wasn't planning on using the entire book, but and I would prefer to have the opportunity to write the material, but they it was an eight week class. And it's, I think I was typing lessons and teaching over Zoom at the same time. What, what we don't want is to delay content materials to the student. And that's, I mean, you're doing the, other, the opposite way, which is benefiting the student by you doing, you know, doing this first time, right? Uh, you know, getting them the, the content materials right away. And that's, and that's the key. What we don't want is, you know, at the end of the day, is delaying the content materials to DSDS students particularly, and because they're not being treated fairly, you know, as everyone else. Right. Uh, what we want to demonstrate at the end of the day, you know, this goes for all faculty, uh, is that we're trying, we're making progress, mm -hmm. and we're and our goal is to be, you know, accessible. And, mm -hmm. and you know, what what they, you know, the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights don't want to see, you know, is that we're not trying. We're, you know, by you trying, it, you're here with us in this group because you care. You want to learn more about making things accessible. And that's what the, you know, the Office of Civil Rights wants to see, you know. Right. And, and uh, thank you so much.